Hello boys and girls, Greg from the Scary Spirits Podcast here to make you another cocktail. This week's cocktail is the Wolf Bite Shooter. And it is the featured cocktail in today's episode, as usual. We're going to start with a shaker with ice. To that, we're going to add... Melon liqueur. One half ounce. Next, absinthe. One quarter ounce. Pineapple juice, one ounce. Then we're going to shake. Going to strain that into our tall shot glass. And we're going to add a splash lemon lime soda. I'm using Sprat. Splash. Whatever. And then a drizzle. Yes, boys and girls, a drizzle of grenadine. There you go. The Wolf Bite Shooter. Kind of separates. Yeah. Not bad. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the podcast. See ya. I am all in for a themed party. And this week's episode of the Scary Spirits podcast, The Beast Must Die, has a great one. I mean, inviting a group of people over on the night of a full moon and then just waiting to see if one of them turns into a werewolf for you to hunt? That's just plain party perfection. The concept of this movie is a good one, kind of like the game Clue, but with lycanthropes. But the execution is where it falls really short. I had high hopes for this movie, and still insist that if there is ever a remake, it has a chance to be much, much better than this one. Just a pointer though, if you're ever going to throw a party like this, don't spill all your secrets to your guests. It ruins all the fun. Cheers! Welcome to the Scary Spirits Podcast. Please be advised that the presenters may use adult language and or discuss adult situations. This podcast is not intended for younger listeners or those that may be easily offended. So, if you're ready, let's go. Hi everyone, I'm Greg. Hey, I'm Karen. And welcome to the Scary Spirits Podcast. The podcast that combines the two very different, yet highly compatible worlds of scary films and alcoholic spirits. What could possibly go wrong? Indeed. How are you, Karen? 
I'm feeling renewed, Greg. Oh, the new year treating you well, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, actually, it is relative to the end of the year. Absolutely. Oh, good. That's right. You were a little ill. Yes, I was. Are you feeling better? I am. You sound better. I do. <laughs> you mean you can actually, I have a voice. I no yeah. long, longer sound like Barry White. Yeah. Although that was kind of cool for a while. It was kind of cool. Too bad it had so much pain associated with it. I had that thing too, right? Didn't you, didn't didn't we talk yeah. and we were both yeah. sounding like Barry White? <laughs> yeah. We should have done a podcast, but too bad I couldn't go more than like a couple minutes without coughing. So yeah, that would have been unfortunate. You would have hated me editing all that out. True, I wasn't quite that bad, but I would have been coughing as well. All right, Karen, uh, whose film was this? You get to claim this one. I don't like your tone, Karen. You never do. <laughs> so the film I have chosen is from 1974, Karen. You remember 1974? I'm sure I do. Called The Beast Must Die. And although it stars Peter Cushing, it is not a Hammer film, Karen. It is a British war film, though. Why did you choose this film? Because of the wolf moon, Karen. It's January. Oh, so you've paid attention to the podcast in the past. I have. You're a learner. You're a lifelong learner. <laughs> yeah, Karen, you never stop learning. I learn something new almost every day, or I try to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> awesome. That's why we get along so Karen, well. I don't like your tone. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't supposed to be funny. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. Do you have a drink to go with this? Movie? I do, Karen. The drink I have chosen is called the Wolf Bite Shooter. Oh, that's appropriate. Yeah, you see what I did there? Yeah. Would you like to know how to make it, Karen? We all would, Greg. Please tell us. <laughs> so we're going to need one half ounce melon liqueur. Midori is a brand name. It's out there. One quarter ounce absinthe. Your one favorite. Ounce... Oh, yes, absolutely. One ounce pineapple juice. One splash of lemon lime soda. I use Sprat. <laughs> and a dash of grenadine, Karen. Which sinks to the bottom. It does. It's very fancy looking. Very theatrical. <laughs> so we're going to gather the ingredients, Karen. Then in a cocktail shaker, we're going to pour the melon liqueur, absinthe, and pineapple juice. Then we're going to fill it with ice. I put ice in first. I don't think so did I. <laughs> Then we're going to shake vigorously. Then we're going to strain that into a tall shot glass, Karen. Then we're going to top it with a splash of lemon lime soda or Sprat. And then we're going to add a drizzle, it says, of grenadine. Not a dash, a drizzle. So I put my thumb over the thing, over the grenadine yeah. bottle and kind of spritzed some in Fancy. there. Fancy. Then we serve and enjoy, Karen. Found this recipe on the Spruce Eats, which I think is a favorite of yours because you seem to use a lot of drinks from there. It has good recipes on it. What can I say? Should we give our friends and listeners time to make their own wolf bite shooter? Yes, we definitely should. Hold on. And we're back. Yes, we are. Karen, might you have a brief synopsis for us? I do. Go on. Tell us all the story. When big game hunter Tom Newcliffe invites a group of people to stay at his estate, they expect a relaxing weekend. Instead, they arrive to learn he thinks one of them is a werewolf and that no one can leave until that person is exposed. Among the suspects are a piano player and his girlfriend an archaeologist, a diplomat, and an artist, all of whom are subjected to a series of werewolf tests. Thank you, Karen. We are a match. Woohoo! All right, Karen, tell us everything you really enjoyed about this film or anything that you were pleasantly surprised by. And just remember, we're trying to keep it under an hour, so. <laughs> okay, well, 
I'll start by saying I had really high hopes for this. I thought the concept was cool. Like I thought it was unique. I thought it had great potential. I really thought it was going to be much more interesting than it was. Almost like Clue or something, but with werewolf exposure instead of, you know, who murdered who or whatever. I was kind of psyched about it. I'd never heard of the movie until you selected it and then told me what it was about. So I I think the concept is a good one. And I, I almost wish someone would remake it and do a better job of it. I liked Peter Cushing. I always do. But he had an interesting accent in this. He was acting. Yes, he was. <laughs> I don't know if he was supposed to be a mayor. I, I don't know. Beyond that, I really don't have much. I, I really don't. Do you? I agree. It was a good premise. I did make a note at one point that, that there were some nice shots in it. There was one with a mirror that I liked at the dinner table, I'll say. I guess maybe there were... I think where I made the note was near the end, I think after the computer equipment's all busted up and he hears the wolf howl and goes out and we get a shot of him leaving through the the computer equipment like there's like a frame and stuff. Framing. There's also some in the woods too where we are seeing the view of someone watching our protagonist okay, i guess yeah but <laughs> there's there's not the a acting lot there. was fine i didn't think so well the, the actress who played caroline they're not caroline who played davina she was very talented karen i thought oh for <laughs> God's sake. no she was not she was very yeah, she was. beautiful i mean i was just looking at her credits here she's she's quite an accomplished actress i mean mostly stage i guess and tv but Miniseries, like British miniseries and things. Pride and Prejudice is what she's most known for, actually. The 1971 BBC miniseries, I believe. It was. I did think it was kind of interesting when the way it starts. We're led down one way and it makes it kind of like a, a rough turn. But it took too long. I, I almost called you because I thought yeah, I was watching I the did. wrong movie. It did take a while. I almost, I almost looked to see... I checked the cast. Ten minutes later. <laughs> it was a long time. It's I think it's longer. And it, it is interesting that they take you down one avenue towards a very trait concept. You know, it it the main character is African American and it looks like he's being hunted in Correct. a forest. So you think, okay, you know, that's seems Prejudice, oh, prejudicial mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like that could happen in the seventies. Right. Yep. And then all of a sudden we get this master turn of events where he's actually the rich guy running the show. Yeah. So hunting that all is the a, white people. Can. Yes, it is. a <laughs> It is a good twist, but or hunting one of the white persons anyway, way too long to the point of almost, and we'll get to it in a minute, but to the point of, Am I watching the wrong movie? What what's happening here? This I agree. So we're we moving on to things we didn't like. <laughs> we only have an hour, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's not that bad. No, it's not. Well, okay. So we already kind of discussed it. It starts off with an interesting twist, but it takes too long. The pacing through the whole thing I thought was very, very slow. Not agonizing, but it was very slow. I hated the main character. He was an asshole. So he was hard to get on board with. Because he's a hunter? Well, no, his acting was just bad, yeah. over the top. And you didn't like him as a person. He's a horrible shot for being a big game <laughs> hunter, which was even frustrating for me. And I don't like hunting. So I was like, oh my God, he can't hit anything. He tells everyone... His entire plan, there's so many Batman moments in this, whereas it would have been such a better movie if they didn't really know he was doing all those things. If they didn't know that the outside had the grid, if they didn't know that what the reason they were all there and they were just enjoying the weekend while he was doing subterfuge around them the whole time. Handing well, he doesn't person. tell them about the grid and stuff until one of them discovers it. 
sort of, but still he tells them everything. He could have just handed everyone a silver spoon over time or, but he taunts them. He brings in the wolf bane and he brings it and Peter Cushing, his sole job is just to explain everything the entire time. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't be that fun at parties. <laughs> I mean, he's just, it's the whole purpose is just, well, you know, if you need a cigar though, he's got one. Yes, he smokes a lot. <laughs> the science is ridiculous. I couldn't even try to begin to well, try to we'll, explain we'll get, what he was talking about we'll, in well, it. I'm going to rely on you to do that, Karen. There are just points like there's a car chase scene where that went on Tom, too long as well. Yes, it was way too long. He keeps taking these shortcuts, but he ends up just as far behind the guy. As he was when he after he took the shortcut, which was ridiculous. Everybody just stays. The town's he acts like 12 miles away is the end of the world. You could get that to there in, you know, I don't know, three or four hours if you walked. It's not that far. You could do it. It wasn't rough terrain. There was a road. But there's but that electric fence karen and, and well we didn't see you. that until late but there's a road <laughs> out so you could have gotten out that way because otherwise he wouldn't have chased the guy it's true yeah. and when he left whenever he left i would have left i mean why would you stick around if you know a werewolf's there and is going to kill you if you weren't the werewolf i would have freaking walked to town <laughs> and screw it you know i'm not staying here to get killed and he brings them all together just for his own hunting pleasure because he's never killed a werewolf. And why would these people come? They don't even know him. You don't think he's doing it for the betterment of mankind? He's no. He's to not. get rid of the werewolf so it no. doesn't kill anybody? And he do, he acts like he knows all these or people. Or bite someone and continue the bloodline. Well, we don't see him kill himself, so I should have said there is some sequel potential. We hear the gunshot. We assume he shoots himself, not to spoil it, but we don't know. We don't see it. We don't see the body or anything, and he's pretty egotistical, so I'm it's not sure. It's not easy he... either to shoot yourself with a rifle. Karen. I was going to say. <laughs> I'll tell you something I noticed right off the bat. He's in. He's running in the beginning, acting like he's being hunted. And I'm like, he's a very smooth runner, very athletic, but he's running in boots, mm -hmm. like these big boots, which I thought was funny, but he's not running with that much fear. You can see it, which once you realize what's happening, you understand why that is, but it's very casual. And then at three different times, somebody captures him or could shoot him, but doesn't. So that was bizarre. It was weird did you not like anything <laughs> i feel like i liked it better than you did Kat. <laughs> i didn't think the werewolf break was necessary i don't know see i didn't mind that where there's i'm a assuming narrator. you watched it on amazon prime yeah. right so you watched the same version because there is another version that that part is taken out i don't i didn't hate that okay i think if the movie it's kind of like i said so a narrator comes on and says Right before the end of the movie, you'll be asked, because you're the detective, who you think the werewolf is. And to be honest, I'm not even sure, because when the werewolf was revealed, I couldn't tell who it was. I don't, I'm like, who is that? I couldn't tell. It was too dark on my screen. I, oh, I didn't do yeah. the high definition. I did the standard. So it was like this, I couldn't tell. Hmm. But I, I actually thought that was kind of different. I, I don't know if I liked it, but I didn't hate it. It could give you some interaction with your friends if you were watching it, like guessing at that point. And it, if it was more well done, it's like a clue, like the game Clue. Like you could have gone around the room if you're watching yeah. and say, who do you think it was? Who do you think? And then see who was correct. So I didn't hate that. But I could see why other people might. Because it does, there's no narration through any other part of the movie. It just pops out of kind of nowhere. Yeah. But it's a gimmick. I guess I'm saying if you're seeing it in a the theater, that part I don't think is necessary. Oh. You know what I mean? I can yeah. see if you're, like you said, if you're like you and a bunch of your friends are sitting around chilling. Well, you're chilling. <laughs> it's, it and... it's the full moon of January. It's the wolf moon. You're like, hey, let's have a party. We'll watch this movie. See if anyone can guess. 
yeah. who who the werewolf is. It's not terribly long. Is it's there now, some, you know, werewolf yeah. wolf cocktails bite. or yeah, and just I think hors d'oeuvres like you know, lady fingers, bloody lady fingers yes. or something. <laughs> I think in that situation, it would be kind of fun to watch. Maybe this some movie. cookies that look like dog biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> You've already half planned your party. <laughs> Yeah, you know. It sounds like you've done this I'm before. I'm fun. I'm fun, Karen. <laughs> so I think if your expectations aren't high and you had, like I said, a party we just discussed or whatever, it could be fun to watch the movie. Is the movie itself good? I didn't think so. But you seem to like it more than me. I just hated the guy. <laughs> mm. And then they kill the dog, which pisses me off. You know, you and you know, I hate that. All right, what kind of cocktail rating you want to give it? Um, it's probably a four. Yeah, I was gonna say three. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, it's your movie. If you want to say three, but we've given some threes oh, to yeah. a lot better movies than this. I'll go with I'll go with your four. I always but... cave to you, Karen. Always, <laughs> as it should be. But again, I think this is a good party movie. If you need a reason for a party, and we don't, I, I don't know that. It, so it's a little slow for a party movie. <laughs> well, you just have a lot of wolf people bites. would lose interest. I think. True, the concept is good. That's what I mean. If somebody remade it, I think it could be good. Okay, it's based on a book, so I don't know how closely. Yeah, it is. This followed the book, so I don't know if a remake could be. It's a lot like. Um, there were two movies it reminded me of. I don't know if it was House on Haunted Hill, where they all gather together. Yep. And also, what was the one about the hunter? Being the hunter versus the hunted, because we get that speech, too, in this one, which was the same as the one where they're trapped on the, the island. The most dangerous game or something yes. like that. Was that it? Yeah. So we get a lot of that, you're either the hunted or the hunter talk. All right. Four cocktails. I tried to find a review, Karen, and I could not. Really? A review of the time, anyway. It's obviously low budget. Yeah, 187,000 pounds. I will say the sets were good. The sets were fine. I should have said that in the beginning. The house is pretty. Mm -hmm. The countryside. The I will. One other thing I didn't mention that I didn't like, the light to dark, when it was mm. daytime, when it was nighttime was very confusing they had, and they had bad filters too sometimes i thought it was the next day and yeah. then i realized it was still the nighttime but it looked like daytime so there wasn't a lot of effort put in that so it was confusing and just not well done and i don't know why they say the full moon lasts three days we saw that in another movie too remember where it was at least two it might have been the wolfman where there were at least Two nights, yes. but I've never heard three. It is usually, of course, werewolf movies where we get that, Karen. Probably something in um, an American world from London, too. Or it could be two nights because I think we looked it up, but I don't ever think it's three. I think is a little pushing it. As I said, I could not find a review of the time, but I can tell you, Karen, that it's got a 43% approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes, 5.6 out of 10. On IMDb, what do you think those Google users think about it, Karen? <laughs> what percentage? Seventy-two percent. Oh, seventy-eight. See that even they bailed on this one. <laughs> All right, are you ready to get into it, scene by scene, Karen? Yes, I'll tell you. It like I said, it's based on a book, and it's a book that's "There Shall Be No Darkness." Mm -hmm. And it's a horror story by the American writer James Blish that was published in 1950. It concerns a group of people in a remote country manor who discover that one of their number is a ravenous werewolf. So published in 1950. All right. Beast Must Die from 1974, rated PG. There was no smoking warning. There was no warnings whatsoever. Which is weird because there was a lot of smoking and drinking. There was a lot of smoking and drinking. We have words to read. Well, we don't have to read them because they're read to us too, right? Yes, the narrator <laughs> makes an appearance here. 
says this film is a detective story in which you are the detective. The question is not who is the murderer, but who is the werewolf. After all the clues have been shown, you will get a chance to give your answer. Watch for the werewolf break. And then the groovy 70s music starts, which is another thing that was just... That's exactly what I wrote. Groovy music. (laughs) The 70s music does not help the film. It's like watching Shaft or something. (laughs) I don't know. Some old police show like Starsky and Hutch. Yes, exactly. Streets of San Francisco. That's kind of the feel it had through the whole whole thing. thing. Yeah. We have credits. And I made a note that they use the Haunted Mansion font. For the no, credits. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Ravenscroft is what the font is called. Oh, the haunted mansion, meaning the Disney ride. Yes. Gotcha. And we see a helicopter chasing a man. It appears in the forest and vehicles are also in pursuit. We see there are surveillance cameras in the forest. Lots of them. Men with weapons go to intercept the man in the forest because they're being led by someone back at I guess base camp <laughs> watching they called it command on, central. Yeah, yes. Command central on, you know, closed circuit TVs. And you can tell it's a grid because he's directing them go to grid number, blah, blah, blah. And then, so they're hunters in a truck and a helicopter and the helicopter can see the man, obviously when he's in the fields and things, but once he goes into the trees, the helicopter can't see him. Then at one point the man is found, but they let him go. Like, the guy with the gun says, bang, you're dead. And the guy says, not until you pull that trigger, boy. And then the, he just clicks, pulls the trigger, it clicks, and then he goes on his way. And you said there are cameras, but there are also microphones buried around so they can hear him breathing and his heartbeat and all these things. That's what the man in Command Central was saying. Yeah. He continues running through the forest. He exits the forest and arrives at an English manor, I wrote, and appears to be shot by the men chasing him. Yeah, in front of a bunch of people having some sort of meal, it looked like. Yeah, having a picnic. That's what I said. (laughs) And they all run to him, and he gets up and laughs. So then we cut to the man and the guy who was directing the men chasing him. So we learn his name is Tom. The man is Tom. Who was being chased, yes. Yeah. And the guy in Command Central was Pavel. It took a long time to figure out his name. And they're discussing the grid system. They used blanks, too, we should say. They yeah. did fire, and then they used blanks. They talk about the grid. This is, we were just getting a lot of background about the grid system and stuff here. That's the whole point of this, right? Yes. He can, Lots of talk about cameras and microphones. I read. And he can detect a human footstep within a range of one mile. The whole area is covered. He can tell the difference between animals and humans. He's got the whole, yeah, there's a whole background system. And we learn, kind of learn a little about how Tom grew his fortune. Sounds like he married up, right? Uh, sounds is like that... to me he was hustling tourists in his village or his Town yeah, and... but then he he followed one to Florida or so he picked uh, the right one and went to Florida. So it sounds like, I don't know, but he's got a lot of money and he's paid for this elaborate system to be put in. And Tom tells Pavel he's going to use the system to hunt the biggest game of all. And this is where they talk about he was born to be a hunter. There's hunted and there's hunters and he's definitely a hunter and all those Kids that still live in his stinking shanty town didn't know how to hustle correctly, but he he's a big deal now. He's very rich. Then we meet all of his house guests, including his wife. And I wrote they each have a shady past, it seems. There's something in their background, Karen. There's a skeleton in their closets. <laughs> Everybody's got skeletons. Although these seem very strange because... Well, we can start. He starts with Bennington, who was a United Nations delegate. And then he does say two members of his entourage mysteriously disappeared. So that's actually his entourage, right? Mm -hmm. He was cleared. It's the whole thing. But but then he talks about the concert pianist who plays all over the world. But now there are certain European capitals where he's not welcome anymore because when he was in those cities there were nasty murders in those cities yes 
how many other people were in those cities? It, it just seemed like he's really stretching. <laughs> he's, you know, I mean, there are shootings every night in Columbus or whatever. And I, I'm here. <laughs> that doesn't mean <laughs> I do them. You know, it's just kind of fun. It seemed like a big stretch there. And his wife. His girlfriend, well. I think. That's his wife. Wait. Now his wife. His ex-student, oh. now his wife. Oh, okay. And then we have Paul, right? Who was an artist who apparently like was in prison for eating human flesh or some shit. <laughs> yes. He was a medical student and they just decided to have a piece of human flesh just to see what it's like. And Professor Lundgren, who I call Peter Cushing the whole time. I call him the doctor sometimes. He's an and, archaeologist. And a lycan lycanthropy enthusiast. Yeah, so he says, Tom says, you study Loop Guru, which is a monster able to change appearance from human to wolf and back again. And it originates the legend of, and Peter Cushing says, I prefer to call it Rougarou. I think he says the legend of Rougarou has been part of the Cajun folklore for centuries. It's said to have originated in French Canadian folklore and then brought to Louisiana by French settlers who migrated to the area in the 18th century. The name Rougarou is derived from the French words loop guru, which means werewolf. And what I found is loop guru transformation is a result of a curse cast by someone very powerful, like a major heavyweight sorcerer or a demon lord or one of the fairy queens. But some sources, there's a difference between the loop guru and the Rougarou, but the Rougarou is a bayou dwelling werewolf. But most people agree that it came from French Canadian immigrants to that area. That's just the doctor's passion. He's an archaeologist by trade. He just likes to study the loop guru, which I'd never heard of. So, you know, I hadn't either. Now I have with the French Canadian immigration. But Tom tells all of his guests that one of them is a werewolf. Well, a actually, he people... says one of you, one of you people is sitting here in this room is a werewolf. But there's one person missing when he says that. Because <laughs> Jan, the pianist, ain't there yet, but his wife is, which I thought was interesting. But whatever. So then later that night, I guess we see Tom's wife confronting him and she thinks it's a joke and he says he's serious and he looks forward to hunting the werewolf. Well, and she says, what if it's me? And he turns around and looks at her and goes, pow. <laughs> it's like, leave him. Red flag, red flag, <laughs> red flag. But what kind of dog do they have in their room? She is a dog. It looked like a lab. It's a yellow lab. Yellow labs, Greg, are incredibly loyal. Great for homes with small children. But another factor that makes labs so compelling is their undeniable intelligence. According to the renowned canine researcher Stanley Corrin, the Labrador Retriever places what on the breeds of most intelligent dogs? Eight. Oh, seven. <laughs> oh, I almost said seven. <laughs> that was pretty good. Oh, well. We have a car chase, what we mentioned before. and Who tries to leave? Yawn. Yawn. Jan has arrived and then he tries to leave. Once he hears what's going on. Yeah. And Tom again, chases him. it's too long of a car chase. And he keeps doing these shortcuts like, ooh, Tom really knows the back ways. And he keeps ending up the same distance behind him. He does finally get in front of him so that he cannot leave. And then he just meekly gets in the car and goes back with him. I don't understand it. He doesn't have a gun or anything. I'd just be like, let me go. Well, Jan even offers to stay. He says, I'll stay if you let the others go. And Tom thinks he's covering for his wife, Davina, yeah. the lovely Davina. Yes. <laughs> you would you would cover for Davina. And there is the 70s groovy music. Would I? <laughs> with the montage of the car chase. Then we cut back to the house and Tom is talking to Pavel again and he says that before the night is out, he will know who the werewolf is. Because and they watch all room. the others on the closed circuit. TV yes, it's very invasive. The house. 
the number of cameras. They're inside the bedrooms. The only place they don't put them is the bathrooms. Yeah. But it's very invasive. Microphones and cameras. And here we learn a little about each guest. Well, Pavel's from Poland. I will say that. <laughs> and that each one has suspicions of being a killer or flesh eater. Yes. <laughs> I said Tom likes a good cigar. as He smokes a lot, too. Then we cut to dinner. Peter Cushing tells everyone that they each have a gland in their necks, Karen. All right, hold on. So <laughs> they do, they cut he to explains, dinner. He has a scientific explanation for lycanthropy. It's dinner time and we talk about werewolves. He says he's going to prove werewolves exist. The conditions are ideal. You have to have a full moon. And then the doctor talks about, he says, each man and each woman has a massive gland in the throat the lymphatic gland that secretes a hormone into the bloodstream called lymph. This gland is the vital element in the condition that creates a werewolf. The fluid it releases is a colorless alkaline resembling blood, but containing no red blood cells. Once it goes into the bloodstream, it causes the disease that causes you to be a werewolf. And as he's talking, they bring in these very large platters of very rare meat Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> for dinner. So, I, I don't know. I, your lymph nodes are small lumps of tissue that contain white blood cells, which fight infection, which is important in a little while because he explains something else. They are part of the body's immune system. They filter your lymph fluid, which is composed of fluid and waste products created by the body's tissues. Lymph nodes help to fight infections. So if you have swollen lymph nodes, you may have felt them in your throat, like right under your jawline, under your ears, they'll swell if you're fighting an infection. But you also have them in your armpits and in your groin area. So you may have felt them there too. They all swell if you're fighting off infections from bacteria or viruses. Lymph is also called lymphatic fluid. It's a collection of the extra fluid that drains from cells and tissues in your body and isn't reabsorbed into your capillaries which is, he says, it doesn't go in into your blood system, I think. It has proteins, minerals, fats, damaged cells, cancer cells, and germs. But several organs in the body secrete lymph. There are bone marrow, spleen, thymus, tonsils, lymph nodes, and other tissues. So I don't really know what he's talking about, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, alkaline well, According to the book, it's the... Basis. The book says... There shall be no darkness. The book that this is based no. on. I was going to say, what book? The book says, says that condition of lycanthropy is the result of a mutation in the pineal gland. Pineal? Does that sound right? Of the afflicted person's brain. So it's a little different. Is there a pineal gland? <laughs> uh, I don't know. How do you spell it? P I N E A L. There is. Hmm? P sized massive tissue behind the third ventricle of the brain secreting a hormone like substance in some mammals well why didn't they just say that because what he says makes no sense maybe because more people know what lymph nodes are than pineal glands i guess but <laughs> lymph nodes are all over your body i don't know it was weird i like the simplicity of a mutation you know it's just it's still i, I don't know how that would happen from being bitten i guess this helps like if you're bitten you could get saliva into your bloodstream. It could be secreted as lymph and then the whole system could start. So I don't know how the mutation would happen after you were bitten, but you could make that up and, and get a mutation. So I don't know. Pineal gland secretes melatonin. Its main purpose is to help control the cycle of sleep and wakefulness. Oh, I need to talk to my pineal glands. <laughs> we need to have a talk. Well, it, it is the least understood gland and was the last part of the endocrine system to be discovered. Endocrine. Endocrine. You know what I meant. <laughs> well, that even better. That would have been, you know, perfect yeah, because agree. no one understands it even better. This was all just made up. Yeah. So then he goes in to talk about how werewolves die due to like core pustles in their blood or some shit. And... Well, that's when you're, so if you're white blood, so what he's saying is 
white blood cells, leukocytes, they protect your body from infection. So if you can't, if you don't have the right amount of those, you're not going to be able to fight off the infection. So that part actually made sense. But he says you'll die a horrible death. But I don't know what the horrible death is. Is this your first time listening to the Scary Spirits podcast? Or maybe you're a regular listener, but missed a few along the way. No worries. Not only can you find every episode on our website, scaryspirits.com, but you'll also get to enjoy awesome show notes too. I just want to say we really appreciate your support. Now let's get back to the show. But anyway, Davina and Caroline lose their appetites. After all Peter Cushing talk. doesn't. He just digs right in. It's funny. Then Tom tells everyone he will track and kill the werewolf because the grounds are covered with cameras and microphones. So this is when he tells them all that shit. Yeah, nobody knows it yet. He just tells them. Mm -hmm. Then Jan grabs a silver candle holder, candlestick, and they decide to pass it around because that'll prove who's a werewolf, right? They can't touch silver, apparently, Peter Cushing says. Yeah, that... Bits of the silver would get in their skin and kill them. Even the touch of silver, death would be almost instantaneous, he says, which mm -hmm. comes into play later. Minute particles of silver would be absorbed by the skin and together with lymphatic hormone would combine to make a deadly poison. And he says, why don't we pass around the candlestick? One of us is a werewolf. They'll drop dead. And they're like, yeah, let's do that. Kind of a classy Russian roulette. And they do. They pass it around. No one dies. And then Peter Cushing later explains that the experiment did not work with the silver because wolf's bane pollen must be in the air. Yes. <laughs> and he says, don't worry, we're safe because wolf, wolf's bane doesn't grow in, the, in Great Britain. But it does. It's a highly toxic and poisonous weed and can be found throughout the UK. It is not only dangerous to humans, but also to wildlife, making its removal crucial task for maintaining a safe environment. So I don't know if that's if you eat it, because he blows the pollen into the room and you see this big puff. So I'm guessing it's not the pollen that will get you. It's the eating it. Should not be taken orally. It's it. Or applied to broken skin where it could be absorbed. But apparently. a lot of people make salves out of it or bruising and it, it stuff is, like that. There are, there is herbal medicine it's used for, apparently. What kind of medicine? Herbal medicine. Herbal, okay. But that's a 50% concentration, apparently. Then we see Tom in a greenhouse with Wolfsbane. So. Right after. Wolf yeah. Spain doesn't grow here. No worries. <laughs> and and while he's in there, someone tries to kill him with a hatchet and he gives chase and then he's nearly killed with a pitchfork, but the tines of the pitchfork go around his neck. <laughs> yes. Very, very convenient. I said, is it missing one? Because how did that happen? Yeah, it's one of those dull, it's like a two-tined thing or something. So then Tom brings the wolfbane into the house with the others and blows the wolfbane pollen into the air, just like he said. Then he goes back to Command Central and begins watching them all on closed circuit television. I did notice that at this point, when he blew the pollen into the air, the diplomat put down his silver chalice immediately. <laughs> did he? Yeah, he seems kind of suspicious. The whole yeah, thing. he he doesn't want to take part in any of this shit. But um, Jan and Davina are missing, and he searches for them on the cameras. And he finds them walking on the grounds, and he listens into their conversation. Then we cut back to inside the house, and I guess they're all back inside, and Jan begins playing Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, Karen. He does. Do you know that he dedicated the Moonlight Sonata to his 16-year-old lover and student? No, I did Whom not. he had fallen in love with at around that time. He proposed marriage to her, but her father forbade her from marrying him as he was without rank. Not because she was 16, but because no. he was without rank. Right. But that's kind of romantic. He's playing. And it is also Sonata number 14 and C sharp minor. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> 
then Tom watches them all still. He's just watching. There is one. I circuit. think this is the part, but I'm not sure. But Pavel says, when you listen in to people talking about you, you're never going to hear good stuff or something. <laughs> he says something like that, you know, like be prepared because when you're listening in to what people are saying about you, it's not going to be how wonderful you are unless it's Greg talking about me. Then they follow Paul on the cameras as he goes into his room. At one point, yeah, he tells I thought him to he zoom had a, in. I thought he had a cane. Remember your prom outfit or something? He's in a whole white suit, and it looked like he had a cane. Didn't you have that? No, I did not. Did, all right. I had the white suit, but you not had the, the white cane. suit. But it looked like that, but it wasn't. It was a rope that he was going to do art with, where you put paint on a canvas and you smack it with the rope or something. With a whip. Anyway, he was. He was taking it apart. Or oh, I thought he was taking it apart. Was he braiding it? I think he was braiding it. And he goes to his room, and you can see there's hair on the back of his hands. Yes. And then Tom watches as Paul gets ready for bed. Yes, it's a little voyeuristic. He's a peeper. But he can't remember if his hands were always that hairy or not. <laughs> <laughs> he can't. And Paul thinks about it in the bathroom shaving it off. But he doesn't. He doesn't. And earlier, somebody says, well, you have hair on your back of your hands. And he's like, well, you know what they say about that. And he somehow tries to link it to masculinity. But I didn't quite get the connection. So Tom watches the others. Caroline's apologizing for Tom being a fun sponge at the party. And Pavel asks if he, Tom wants to watch his guests in bed. And Tom says, I am no voyeur. But he is. He grabs his rifle and says he's going to get some rest and tells Pavel to let him know if anything happens, basically. But first he changes into his leather hunting outfit. Yes, his black <laughs> leather. With no shirt on, just black leather. I thought that was kind of funny. But no, I thought he's going to go out, but no, he's just going to sleep in a chair with his rifle and wait for something to happen. And right here, I checked the time. It's 45 minutes, almost exactly. Exactly half over, pretty much. That's impressive. <laughs> then the perimeter lights go off, indicating that something is out there in the grid. From the house into the grid. Yes. And Pavel wakes Tom. They have no visual on what's moving out there yet. I don't know. I didn't understand that because they didn't have any problems before. Tom takes his gun and goes out. And Pavel guides him towards the target. Strictly by... The microphones and crap. He still doesn't have camera. Well, but he knows from his technology, his program, that it's a large four-legged animal, 159 pounds, standing in the river. So the animal approaches Tom. He shoots at it several times, missing it. Yes, totally missing it. Pavel tells him the target's headed for the house. Tom thinks it's coming for Pavel to stop him from guiding and helping him. Tom tells Pavel to protect himself. Close the door. Pavel gets a gun and checks all the cameras. And we see a shadow moving behind Pavel. <laughs> yes. And I wrote, there's a large dog above him. I guess there it's a, a wolf. Yes, but it's a very... You know, there was a little bit of shadow is that work there. Is? A skylight? It looked bigger than a skylight, but... I couldn't think of the word. <laughs> it's like a conservatory. There's a whole... Which is weird. So there's a whole glass ceiling behind him, but he's watching all those monitors. You would definitely not want a glass ceiling behind you if you're watching monitors. So he takes a couple shots at the wolf, but it jumps on top of him. He screams. Tom arrives to find Pavel dead. I thought that's a good plan for the werewolf. Take out yeah. the monitoring system first. Right. And if he hadn't had if he hadn't explained to everyone that he had the monitoring system, then they wouldn't have known. But I thought that was a clever But nobody approach. knew about Pavel. No one ever finds out about Pavel. Really. No. <laughs> well, the werewolf knows. He go. And I wrote it looks like some of the computer is damaged as well. Yeah, they took out a lot of it. And yeah. Whatnot. So then the house guests all come out of the rooms after hearing the gunshot and scream. All except for Paul, Karen. He's missing. Tom goes to Paul's room and finds the window open and Paul in bed. Naked. 
Yeah, he wakes him up, and then Arthur finds sleeping pills by his, Paul's bed. And Peter Cushing asks if anyone is missing. Anyone in the house missing? And Tom says no. Doesn't mention Pavel again. Keeping Pavel a secret. Next day, Tom telling the helicopter pilot to be on standby that evening. The guests are all playing croquet in the, back, in the backyard, which yeah. is a sport that involves hitting wooden or plastic balls with a mallet through hoops embedded in a grass playing court. It was first played in 1856. It was in the Olympics only once in the 1900 Summer Olympics. I was impressed by that. We, we used, used to, play to have it all the time. Yeah, the, we, we used had a to. Set. We had we all had sets. I didn't really know how to play it, but we you know, hit the ball through the little hoops, you know. Did you knock other people's balls out of the way? Too, yeah, but there is, I'm sure there were many more rules <laughs> than we knew about, you know. But yeah, it was very popular as when I was a kid. Everybody had a set of them. And then Davina tells Caroline to tell Tom that Jan has had a setback and they would like to leave right away. I don't know what the fuck that means setback was he ill or something no i don't know it's ever says anything about yawn being ill but tom pays her no attention and then we see doesn't tom allow it no then we see tom disabling the vehicles <laughs> yes because he i'm surprised he didn't do that first making sure no one can leave but is i wrote is someone watching him and the dog's following him his dog and then someone with a bow and arrow starts to take a shot at tom but the dog barks, warning him, I guess. And, and I and said, that's a man hand. Tom goes to throw the car parts in a pond or a stream or something. And an arrow almost hits him. And we see it's Paul. He was he drunk. Goes, Oops, I missed. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of funny. He was definitely a little Paul, wasted. Yeah. Paul teases Tom, basically tells him he's been tracking him. Been hunting the hunter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Paul looks like he'd be fun at parties. Got nice hair, too. And Tom tells the others they cannot leave. They have Of course to... he tells them, because he tells everybody everything. They have to stay one more night and that the phones are dead. Because someone says, well, I'm going to call the cops. And he's like, oh, unfortunately, the phones are appear to be down. <laughs> Whatever. And then he taunts them, see if anybody wants to play the candle game again. The candlestick game. Yeah. Paul grabs it. None of the others do, though. I made a note. But Caroline takes the candlestick from Tom and throws it across the room, smashing a mirror. I think that's seven years of bad luck for her, isn't it? Yeah, if she lasts that long. <laughs> and she's had enough. But apparently she cuts her hand as well on a glass or something. And she runs off. And we see Tom loading his rifle with silver bullets. And then we see hey, the full moon. The first time we see the full moon, I think. We, we saw actually it the first see night. it. Yeah, Did we, we see it? it? Same shot. And looks like Tom has even bigger guns this time. And he's got his soldering iron out, Karen. He's fixing the broken computer. Yes. <laughs> this is soldering iron. All the monitors are crashed. <laughs> it's broken. He's not going to be able to fix it. And we hear a wolf howl. Tom checks all the rooms and Paul is missing. Tom jumps in the helicopter. They take off, and Tom tells the pilot they will have no help from the house. They must use infrared cameras, I guess, on the helicopter. Uh, yeah, and he does have silver bullets. So infrared camera is a measuring instrument used for non-contact measurements of the surface temperature of objects. So what he's looking for, it's also referred as a thermal camera. So you can see heat on the ground. So he's going to be able to see if the werewolf is running, right? The thermographic camera creates an image using infrared radiation similar to a normal camera that forms an image using visible light. Instead of the 400 to 700 nanometer range of a visible light camera, infrared cameras are sensitive to wavelengths from about 1,000 nanometers to about 14,000 nanometers. But it measures heat, so they should be able to see it. And it's hooked up on the bottom of the helicopter. But the wolf passes underneath them. Tom fires his automatic rifle at it. Completely missing. Yep. The wolf manages to stay one step ahead of him as he's shooting and helicopter lands. And Tom follows the wolf into a shed and begins firing into the shed. 
I think it's the greenhouse. And I wrote, apparently he has unlimited ammunition, Karen. Yes. Well, yes. And he can't hit the broad side of a barn. <laughs> and I said, this isn't hunting. I could hunt like this. You know, this is, and I would probably hunt the same because he's missing the entire, I, I at this point, I said, he's supposed to be this big shot hunter and he can't hit anything. And Caroline and the dog arrive. And, Caroline... and the pilot, I just want to say, is wearing sunglasses at night. <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> which is ridiculous, but. Oh, he's Corey Hart. <laughs> yes. <laughs> then the dog and the wolf fight and Caroline prevents Tom from shooting at them because I guess she's afraid that he will hit the dog. Yes. The wolf leaves the shed and attacks the helicopter pilot. Again, Tom shoots at it, hitting the helicopter, and it explodes. <laughs> right. And I think he hits the helicopter pilot, too. Well, whatever. Pilot's dead. The wolf killed the pilot, for sure. So then Peter Cushing arrives at the shed, and they watch the helicopter burn. And we cut back to the dog, and he seems to be hurt pretty bad, Karen. But Caroline was there when the wolf was there. Yes. So that's an important piece of information that I made a note of. And now Davina has arrived as well. But the wolf's not there then when Peter yes. Cushing or Davina shows up. But when Caroline was there, she saw the wolf fighting with her dog. But if you're trying to find out who the werewolf is, I mean, the wolf leaves and here's Peter Cushing dressed. Dressed to the nines. Yes. yes. His hair is perfect. Yes. <laughs> and then I shortly agree. after is the lovely Davina looking beautiful in her white nightgown <laughs> right so anyway so tom asked davina to take caroline back to the house and then he asks peter cushing to escort them to be sure they get there safe yeah because he's going to shoot the dog is what i said because the dog is hurt pretty bad yep so tom <laughs> shoots the dog yeah there you go would the dog turn into a wolf as he got don't bitten know. don't know good question Back in the house, Tom fires a gun to wake everyone up, I think. He just fires it into the <laughs> ceiling of the house. And he questions Paul and Jan. They each say they went out when they heard the wolf howl, but they can't prove anything. So then Tom goes to Arthur's room, the politician, and it don't look good, Karen, because there's no, blood everywhere. <laughs> and the room's destroyed. And we see Arthur on the floor. He go. You know, the guy who played Arthur was Blofeld and James Bond. I don't was... really watch James Bond movies. Yeah, that's, I recognize them. He was Blofeld and Diamonds Are Forever. And I guess it's the next day. House guests want to call the police. Tom refuses. He said, but they say there's two people dead. Well, they don't know about Pavel. He's dead, no, they too. they don't know. Yeah. There's three people dead. He says they have one. He has one night left. Tonight the beast dies. <laughs> Which... Well, whatever. Very selfish at this point. So then we see Paul in the forest. Looks like Paul he's trying flips to find out. a way he's out. He's trying to get out, running along, and then he hits the electric fence. Yeah. And as he's running towards the fence, I'm like, I bet that's an electric fence. And then, yeah, I didn't even think of that. But yeah, he grabs it and he gets a little shock. But then he finds a tree, which is very close to the fence, and he figures he can scale it and jump over it. But he falls, and Tom finds him. Tom's right behind him. And right here we have the werewolf break, Karen. You have 30 seconds to decide who the werewolf is. So I knew it wasn't Peter Cushing, but I just went with Peter Cushing because he's the biggest <laughs> star that I knew. I thought, well, it's not Caroline. She was there with him, you know, and they're trying too hard to make it Paul. Yeah, trying to you force know. Paul on you. Yeah. So I was just kind of like, well, I couldn't remember who anybody else was. So I'm like. I'm going with, because Tom thinks it's Davina, so it's not Davina. And I couldn't remember the other guy's name, Jan. So I was like, well, I'm going to go with Peter Cushing. <laughs> there was a whole part at dinner where he was, I feel sorry for the person who is the werewolf. It's not their fault. There's nothing they can do. This whole sympathetic thing and how the werewolf is actually a victim, not the perpetrator and all that kind of stuff. Then our 30-second timer clocks down. Well, they show a picture of everyone in the house yeah. so you can remember. And then Tom confronts Paul. Paul said he was trying to leave because he was scared, not because he is a werewolf. And Paul grabs the silver candlestick once again to prove that he is not the werewolf. 
Tom is not convinced. And Tom forces them all to place a silver bullet in their mouth. Because I guess Peter Cushing says something about, well, you could put something on your hand so that you'll be protected or whatever. Right. And Tom says, well, surely you won't put something coating your tongue. And he <laughs> makes them all in your mouth silver. and he makes them put. And that, do they pass the one bullet around? I don't. That's what I couldn't tell. When they gave it to Peter Cushing, he, he wiped, wiped it, it off. off. And I was like, that's what I, I wouldn't <laughs> be putting it one. in my mouth if someone else put it in their mouth. And then he wiped it off when he was done, too. But anyway, He's a gentleman. He is. So then Caroline puts it in her mouth. And as she does, she turns into a wolf. But isn't she supposed to die immediately? Tom shoots her. Yeah, but in the that's the whole their whole discussion about the candlestick is it's they true. would die immediately. It's true. She doesn't die, she turns. Yeah, she doesn't die, she turns. So then Tom and Peter Cushing deduce that Caroline must have gotten her blood mixed in with the blood of the werewolf the previous night when the dog was attacked in the shed because she was there. So she yeah. couldn't have been the wolf. No, and she was trying to comfort the dog, and the dog was all bloody. And she had an open wound on her hand. From the earlier and the, yes, when she broke it with the dish. So then we hear Davina scream. They run up to find her over Paul's dead body. <laughs> His throat's torn out. I said, there are going to be some traumatized people here. I think Tom says he has one bullet left. Yes, he has one bullet left. Tom leaves the mansion and chases the wolf. But he doesn't have his hunting outfit on anymore. He's not in black leather. I think he's in white now. The wolf attacks Tom. Tom shoots it as they struggle. And then the wolf turns into Yawn. I didn't recognize him. It's like, who is that? I thought it was like a caretaker or something. I completely couldn't tell who it was. So get it's the a, high definition people or you won't be able to see who it is. It's a very young Michael Gambon. Do you recognize him? Uh-uh. So I kept waiting for where, because I knew Michael Gambon was in it. I'm like, when's he going to show up? And then I'm like, oh, shit, he's young because he's very young. You know, like I know him from like the Harry Potter stuff and stuff when he's old. You know, he was Dumbledore. I thought <laughs> Ian Mc... No, who was... Du oh, well, I didn't watch those movies earlier. There were two Dumbledores. Oh, gotcha. Because one died during okay. the, the sequels, sequels and whatnot. Yeah. So Tom returns to the house and tells Davina he is sorry. And then he realizes he was bitten by the werewolf. Tom takes the silver bullet and the rifle and goes okay, back into the house. So he picks up the silver bullet, mm -hmm. which they have the long discussion at dinner, where if you touch the silver, you're going to immediately die. But maybe he, he hasn't turned yet. Maybe it doesn't affect him. I guess. But he doesn't turn either like Carolyn did. She turned when she touched the when mm -hmm. she put the bullet in her mouth. I guess maybe it hasn't been long enough. I'll give you that. But it was like, come on, consistency here. <laughs> Takes the silver bullet and the rifle and goes back into the house. He loads the rifle and he appears to shoot himself in the head. That's what we're led to think. Well, yeah, we get a shot of the outside of the manor and we hear the gun go off. Credits, the end. Really like the concept, but just... You got to make Tom a more likable dude, I think. You think it would have been better if Peter Cushing would have played Tom? Well, of course. <laughs> but if you're at, nobody can make, I mean, as we always say, you're not the boss of me. You can't make me stay here. He's one dude. It's not like there's It's guards not like they're on around. an island or anything either. Right. Like in at first, that's what I movie. thought when we were doing me too. The, pan in like you're getting shots from a helicopter i'm like oh is it an island there's not guards around there's not you're not on an i i would just well he does like, have a lot of armed men chasing him in the beginning but i don't know where they all go to after that i think it was just the test i don't know why they stay i would be like and at one point it does say he has sent all the help home right or off so away that's the he means the domestic help i think i thought yeah but, yeah i know but I would just be like, I'm out of here. You're not the boss of me. I'm not staying here. I'm not going to get killed. He's responsible for every death there because he invited all these people to find the werewolf for his own selfish reasons. He's responsible for every single person that died that wasn't the werewolf. It's true. I'm all fired up about it. <laughs> I think that's why I didn't really care for it. 
you had to make him more likable somehow where people would want to stay, you know, and more like a party game where maybe he doesn't really believe it. So, you know, I, I just don't see why anyone would stay in a dangerous situation, especially after the first person was killed. Or if there's would, promise of some reward if you make it through three nights. Right, or something, because somebody's dead and you're playing croquet. It's like, <laughs> this is weird. They didn't know Pavel was dead, but still, I just felt like it was, I would never leave my room. And I would find out what I needed to keep a werewolf away from me. Like, everybody's so casual about it. Until all of a sudden, you know. I mean, one person dies the first day, like the pilot's dead, that nobody, nobody cares, really. They just stay. I don't know. It just didn't make any sense to me. All right, Karen, what'd you think of the wolf bite shooter? I do like the drink, although I've sipped it instead of taking too. it all in one shot. I like it. It's, but I the, made mine a double, so. The melon mixes surprisingly well with the absinthe with the licorice flavor does pleasantly surprised by that it's a good combination and the acidity of the pineapple adds something it's it's very good as a sipping drink it's all right well i know you don't like absinthe so no, it doesn't have a lot of it in it though i did taste it but but once again i made mine a double as i said well you took one for the team i'm a giver that you are anything we learned today karen we learned about infrared cameras, croquet, that this movie was based on a book by James Blish, lymph nodes, lymph, lymphatic system, alkaline. My favorite thing I learned was the uh, loop guru and gur wait, what's the other one? Ru guru and loop guru and that lab, yellow labs or labs. There are three labs, yellow black and brown chocolate, they call it. Seventh on the list of most intelligent dog breeds. You got a Corey Hart reference in there. I did. To all you Gen Xers that know sunglasses at night. <laughs> Anything else? I don't think so. A little about Wolf Spain too. Did you mention Wolf Spain? True, that it does grow in the UK when they said he didn't. It grows in the States too. I did kind of find it kind of interesting that the wolf was black. You know, I don't know. We learned about the Moonlight Sonata, too. Yeah, I think it was, it, I don't know if it was a German Shepherd. It was a big dog. It was a big dog. Big, fluffy dog. Um, was it, but it, was looked it like, a Malamute? No, it looked like a German Shepherd. It was too fluffy. They they can be fluffy. Okay. It was big. Big dog. It was bigger than that lab, I assume. It was a dog. Could Could have been a domesticated wolf trained wolf i don't think so i yeah. guess it could have wolves are almost skinnier than that in general true it was a big thick thick dog yeah could have been its coat well they said it was 150 pounds or something right yeah i don't know if it was really 150 pounds but according to the technology but they could have just been making that up all right ready to move on to the next film karen yeah, I just, this one had so much potential. Did it? <laughs> well, it's a diff, it was really a different concept for a werewolf movie. Yeah, different. What are we doing next week, Karen? I have no idea, Greg. You have no idea? <laughs> no, we're going to have a guest. Oh, come okay. in. Okay, do we've tell. In, we've invited one of our <laughs> listeners, Courtney, to choose a movie and a drink. And come and join us on the podcast. Okay. I guess we'll find out. Yeah, we'll find out. Stay tuned. <laughs> Tune in next week. <laughs> Same bat station. Or what is it? Same bat channel. Same bat time. Same bat channel. And we'll find out what we're going to do. Well, it's a new thing. Killing we're, me. we're trying. We'll see <laughs> if it goes well. Maybe we'll invite someone else. You too could be on the Scary Spirits podcast picking a movie and a drink. I know that people are so excited. You hear the crowd. <laughs> Gasp. <gasps> really? Me? Me? Yes, you. Just email Greg. And we'll get you on. Greg at scaryspears.com. 
info exactly. at scaryspirits.com. Karen at scaryspirits.com. Karen doesn't get any email. Karen at scaryspirits.com. <laughs> Thanks for telling everyone that, Greg. <laughs> Wah, wah. Karen doesn't get any email. All right, I'm just, anyone? I'm just in everyone's thoughts all the time, Greg. I'll just go with that. All right, anyone you want to thank this week, Karen? Well, I'd like to thank our listener. There's a lot of podcasts out there. Thank you for spending time with us. Who do you need to thank, Greg? Karen, I need to thank the people of the great state of Georgia. Woohoo! The Peach State. And... A user named Vector One Classified on YouTube. Ooh. <laughs> if that is your real name. It sounds very James <laughs> Bondy. All right. We've made it. We're in the British intelligence. Or they're watching us, Karen. I don't well, know. Well, or that. <laughs> Ting. All right. Anything else, Karen? Please drink responsibly. Yes. Thanks so much for listening. Want to keep in touch? Check out our website, scaryspirits.com. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Scary Spirits Podcast. Find us on YouTube at Scary Spirits Podcast. If you have questions or comments, you can email us at info at scaryspirits.com. To help us grow the podcast, you can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. You know, we really do appreciate your support. And as always, please drink responsibly. Mm-hmm.